Hello everyone, this is Professor Casey. Uh, welcome to our journey through American history. Okay, For those of you who are taking my History 1301 class, this is the very first chapter of our textbook. Okay, And these presentations that I've got lined up here are all adapted from David Emery Shai's America, A Narrative History. Okay, This is from the 11th edition that was published in 2019. Um, all of the information that you find here, of course, uh, is adapted, and I stress adapted just for copyright issues. I'm not directly um, taking anything from the chapters themselves, okay? I'm trying to paraphrase as much as I can, um, but there is no real uh, copyright on history itself, thankfully, okay? So we can kind of talk about it here and there, um, and I'll insert uh, a few things that really aren't even covered in the book, okay? Some things that the author himself uh, has chosen to skip over for one reason or another. Okay, so we begin with chapter one, of course, and chapter one deals with um, the meeting of pre-Columbian cultures with European civilizations. Okay, this is the beginning of what we acknowledge as American history for the most part. Okay, we have to delve a little bit further back into the past as far as we possibly can. Um, and we even have to begin with the fossil record in some cases, okay, with the very first human civilizations here in North America, um, and eventually move on, of course, into um, the uh, the landing of Christopher Columbus, among others. So, uh, so let's go ahead and get started here. All right, so the first group that we can really discuss here um, is the first acknowledgeable human civilization in the Americas, okay, dating from approximately 12,000 BCE all the way up to 5,000 BCE, okay? And for those of you who are wondering why BCE and not BC, okay, um, they both essentially mean the same thing. BCE simply stands for Before Common Era, okay? This is the most... Uh, 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 it's the normalized academic way of saying BC. Okay, BC is uh, kind of the the um, uh, archaic way of saying it before Christ. Okay, so this is a little bit more of a neutral stance of this. Um, so we call this group of people the Paleo Indians. Okay, and we estimate around 12,000 BCE again based on fossil records. Okay, based on what information we have uh, based on migration patterns that we've been able to detect. Um, the first people who came to North America came over again sometime around 12,000 BCE, okay? And as you can see from the map here, they appear to have migrated from Siberia, okay? And Siberia, of course, is part of modern-day Russia, okay? It's Russian territory these days. Um, but 12,000 years ago, or over 12,000 years ago now, 12,002 whatever that is, 14,000 years ago, I guess now, um, there was actually a land bridge that existed between Siberia and North America, okay, connecting Alaska to Siberia, okay? And this particular um, land bridge is known as Beringia, okay? Um, and part of the reason why this land bridge doesn't exist anymore is, number one, it was made out of ice, okay, for, for the most part, okay? Um, the, of course, the temperature in the entire world back then was extremely cold, okay? This is still back in the midst of the Ice Age. Um, and during this particular time, this land bridge existed uh, over the oceans, and of course, the oceans themselves hadn't risen to the levels that they're at today either, okay? Um, the, the entire debate about global warming and so forth is really a thing, okay? If you go back far enough, you'll realize that the, um, the land masses in the, in the north, especially in the, the Arctic Circle, which is kind of the area we're discussing here, um, land masses, of course, were much bigger. The ocean levels hadn't risen yet because the polar ice caps hadn't begun to melt yet. Okay? So most of the northern hemisphere at this point is actually covered in a pretty thick layer of ice and snow. Right? So these people were able to essentially migrate from the European continent across the Beringian Strait and into North America. Okay. And, of course, once they did manage to arrive here, they got a little bit further south, it got a little warmer, it was easier for them to live, survive, and so forth, so they had no real reason to go back. Okay. So, again, this landmass is called Beringia. Okay. It connects Asia, the Asian continent, Eurasian continent, that is, to North America. And these groups of people, the Paleo-Indians themselves, for all we know about them are that they were hunter-gatherers, okay? And what we mean by that, of course, is the fact that they hunted as part of their diet, okay? They hunted uh, large groups of what we call megafauna. We'll discuss that here in a few minutes. And they were gatherers, okay? They, you know, forage for nuts and berries, uh, roots, anything that they could eat, 
okay? So they had a pretty tough time of it, right? Most of their daily activity was spent finding food, okay? And of course, when we're in the midst of the latter part of the ice age here, there's not really a whole lot to go around, okay? Uh, most of it would have to be um, uh, an animal-based diet more so than anything else, because again, a lot of the um, a lot of the flora of the of the world is still buried under a pretty thick layer of ice and snow. Um, from what we know about the, um, again, from the fossil record, from skeletal remains we found is that the men were much larger than the women, okay? Um, of course, you can uh, distinguish between male and female skeletons based on certain things, um, the wideness of, uh, of the pelvic iliac crest, okay, or perhaps even if you look at the skull, skulls on men are typically a little bit larger and they have a larger um, uh, forehead, okay? The, uh, the eyebrow ridge is usually a little bit more pronounced, okay? And from what we know about them, too, based on fossil evidence and from one of the pictures you see here, is that this was actually a very aggressive society, okay? Um, the, and the reason that we're able to determine that is just about every single skeleton that has been discovered dating back to this time period appears to have died from a violent death, okay? Either from intertribal warfare, perhaps, or even uh, caught in conflicts with some of the animals that exist, okay? This particular um, skeleton that you see here, the skull, appears to... Uh, have lost most of its teeth, for one thing, okay? And also you can see that there is a noticeable wound right in the center of the forehead, okay? This fellow may have very well died from a blow to the head, okay? So, uh, again, for all we know about this, this was uh, kind of a, um, a survival of the fittest type situation, right? People were uh, in direct competition with one another on a regular basis for food, okay? So this was a, a very difficult time, obviously, to live. And on average, you can estimate that the, um, the longest a person would live during this time period, whether from illness, from exposure, from a violent death, is probably no more than 25, okay? So if you made it to the age of 25, you were considered a senior citizen, okay? Um, anybody who lived past that, it was extremely uncommon. Most people did die from an infection of their teeth. Uh, and, and again, as you can tell from the skeleton, the skeleton has no teeth, okay? Um, and it's very easy to die from an infection from the teeth, more so than we might realize, okay? Um, the upper mandible of the skull, if, uh, if something gets infected in there, the infection can spread to the brain and ultimately kill a person that way. Okay, so that's essentially what happened more often than not here. And one particular group of people we could discuss here um, that dates approximately from about 9500 BCE is a group that we call the Clovis people. Okay, um, and this is considered the first recognized North American society with a specific cultural influence. Okay. Um, and we call them Clovis people because the, um, the site that has most of the recognizable artifacts, uh, skeletal remains, and cultural remains of, of all different kinds was discovered in Clovis, New Mexico in 1929. Okay, so that's the only really real reason it's called Clovis people. Um, but Clovis people existed all over the country. Okay, this is just one specific uh, instance, the first instance that they were discovered. Okay. Um, and they're recognized specifically for their stone tools, in particular the Clovis Point, okay? And you see this little um, stone tool up here at the top right corner. This is a Clovis Point, okay? Uh, it's kind of this leaf-shaped stone that was carved this way to be used either as a hand tool to uh, grind up grain or to uh, cut animal hides off of an animal to carve meat. Um, could even be made into a much uh, smaller version of this and uh, put on the end of a spear shaft. Okay, as you see here in the photograph, Clovis people hunted megafauna primarily. Uh, Clovis people are also um, uh, given the credit for the mastery of fire. Okay, so they did manage to uh, discover fire, managed to use it to warm themselves, to, uh, to tan hides, to cook animal meat, and so forth. Uh, and as it relates to the animals, again, when we discuss megafauna, uh, the term megafauna basically means large animal, okay? And specifically animals that are uh, extinct here in North America, okay? You can't find these animals anymore. Um, most of uh, the megafauna that people are familiar with, of course, are the mastodon or the woolly mammoth, okay? Um, some are familiar with the smilodon, aka the saber-toothed cat that you see here. 
Of course, there were ancient bison that existed, uh, small horses, very akin to zebras that existed here in the Americas. Uh, we had camels at one point. And of course, there are also larger um, predators that used to exist here that uh, were also hunted to extinction. Okay? Uh, American lions existed at one point, right? a, a kind of a, a distant cousin of the modern day mountain lion, perhaps. Um, and of course, if you're a fan of Game of Thrones, as I am, you might recognize the dire wolf down here at the bottom. Okay, this was an actual animal that existed. Um, and a dire wolf, uh, imagine it being a wolf roughly the size of a lion. Okay, this is a, a very large predator. Okay, something that uh, in, in modern day you wouldn't run, want to run into it with advanced weaponry, let alone having only a spear. Okay, and of course, the Smilodon, the saber toothed cat. Uh, is much larger than what is usually depicted in, um, you know, in films and so forth. Smilodons were usually about the size of a horse. Okay, so imagine a predator that size uh, chasing you down. You probably wouldn't stand much of a chance. And of course, we had other things, larger cave bears um, and large ground sloths too. And ground sloth is roughly the size of a horse as well. Okay, um, not necessarily a predator, but of course, it has large enough claws where it would be able to defend itself if necessary. Okay. So again, very different world uh, that existed this uh, long time ago that we um, obviously wouldn't recognize today. Okay? The landscape itself has changed dramatically. The climate has changed dramatically. Um, if you were transported in time uh, roughly 10,000 years ago, you would not recognize uh, the country that we're living in. One specific example of uh, a human being dated from this particular time period that has gone through um, facial reconstruction and so forth is an individual called the Kennewick Man. Okay, this is a skeletal, uh, a, a complete skeleton that was discovered in Kennewick, Washington, um, sometime back in the 90s and 1996, I guess specifically here. Um, and as you can see here, this is roughly what humans looked like back then. Again, if you saw this fellow walking down the street today, you wouldn't think twice about it. Okay? Humans look very much the same today as they did that long ago. Okay? Uh, um, over time, of course, humans have evolved. We have um, you know, designated specific cultures. Uh, skin tones have changed slightly depending on uh, what latitude you live in. Okay? If you live closer to the equator, you have more melanin in your skin tone. Your skin tone is darker. If you live further away in the colder regions, again, over time, humans develop lighter skin and lighter hair color, okay? Just because um, you, uh, you need more of the ability to develop uh, vitamin D, okay? Because you don't have access to direct sunlight anymore, okay? So that's essentially what happens to humanity over time. Um, and again, the Kennewick Man is really important because it's the most complete Paleo-Indian skeleton that we have, okay? Again, for most of the other instances, um, individuals would have died a pretty violent death. And based on facial reconstruction, this fellow looked like he might have been in his 40s, perhaps, and that's a pretty um, uncommon uh, age to live to again during this time period. So again, it's hard to tell, but um, this is kind of what we have to work with anyway. Now, the next stage in human development in the Americas uh, happened sometime around 5000 uh, CE, or 5000 BC up to the year 750 CE. Okay? This is getting more into um, the period that we call uh, the Iron Age, uh, leading all the way into the Dark Ages in Europe. Okay? Europe is uh, developing a little bit more uh, quickly than the Americas are at this point. Right? Most American societies are still tribal. Um, they're still uh, you know, using rather primitive tools and ways of life and so forth. Um, because of the necessity for food and the fact that there are uh, enough people at this point in time, uh, megafauna get hunted almost to extinction. And in some cases, they do get hunted completely to extinction. This is why we see so many animal species dying off during this time period. Um, it's estimated that the, uh, the mammoths were one of the last to go. In fact, there were mammoths that existed on some of the islands off the coast of Siberia when the pyramids were being built. So just to put it in perspective and in, uh, in world events, okay, this was something that did exist at the time. Um, but once megafauna get hunted to extinction, right, we have to adapt. Okay? We have to find a way to make a living here. And because the climate is gradually beginning to warm up, Okay, some animal species even are unable to adapt to climate change. Okay, you have animals like the woolly mammoth and so forth that have these really heavy, thick coats. They're not able to regulate their body temperature very well, and some of them end up just dying off that way. 
So roughly around 7500 BCE, maybe even 5000 BCE, um, we began to move into agriculture. Okay? And if you look at different societies all over the world around this same time period, around 7500 BCE, it's a very interesting trend because most uh, societies that existed in different cultures and different corners of the world that were not even connected with one another all developed agriculture around the same time. Okay? It's almost like they all had an epiphany at the exact same time to know how to do this. Okay? So kind of a bizarre little phenomenon. Um, and of course, agriculture, as we know now, has a lot of different benefits. Okay? For one thing, it provides a reliable food source. Okay? If you are able to master the seasons, know kind of the weather patterns, um, the climate that you live in, whether you need irrigation of some kind, um, it allows you to have a certain cycle of food production. Okay? Of course, the more nutritional foods you eat, if you vary up your diet a little bit, you have better nutrition, you have better life expectancy. Okay, you might not be fighting for food as much anymore, so you might not be engaging in tribal warfare, you might not be fighting off animals as much, so you might live longer. And of course, the longer you live, if you have enough time, you end up reproducing, okay? which leads to a much bigger population. Okay? Uh, people are able to settle in one particular place, and of course, um, in, in paleo Indian times before this, it would have been very, very difficult to survive childbirth, or to survive infancy for that matter. Okay. So now people are actually able to uh, settle down in one place, the climate's a little bit better, they can actually nurture and, and bring children up a little bit easier. Okay. And of course, all this goes into a chain to establish permanent villages, okay. like you see here in the background. This might have been uh, an example of an archaic Indian village from the time period. And of course, the primary crops that are grown during this time period are ones that we see all the way through to the time when Europeans first arrive in the Americas. Okay, these are the kind of the traditional crops that are grown. Uh, maize, of course, is the one that you probably hear about the most. This is corn. Okay? Uh, different uh, species of beans, squash, chili peppers, pumpkins, and avocados. Okay? Um, interesting thing about avocados, it's estimated that uh, woolly mammoths may have been the ones that saved avocados from extinction, um, primarily because woolly mammoths appear to have liked avocados. Okay? From some of the um, uh, remains that have been dug up over time, um, and in some cases you find the contents of an animal's stomach have been preserved over time, and in many cases avocado stones are, are still inside there. Okay? So sometimes these animals would literally eat these things, they would migrate, and then poop out the seed, okay, which would then sprout into a tree. Okay? So if you like avocados, if you like guacamole, you have woolly mammoths to thank for keeping them alive. Um, another thing that archaic Indians managed to uh, put together are brand new uh, tools and weapons. Okay? Um, for one thing, the atlatl is something that is a brand new idea. Okay? This is a precursor to the bow and arrow. And the way that it works, the best um, modern example I can get of this is uh, something like a catapult. Okay? If you ever go to a toy store, for example, or a, a pet store, for example, um, they make the, the dog toys that are like a little wand that have a cup on the end that you put a ball in. Okay? And if you fling this little wand, it's like a little catapult, it launches the ball further than you can throw it. Okay? And it's the same basic concept with the atlatl. Okay? You have a little handle like this guy has here that you attach a spear to the end to. Okay? And when you fling it, the spear comes off the end of the handle and can fly further and faster than if it was thrown simply by hand. And it's more accurate, too. Okay? So given greater velo velocity and greater force on this, you can pierce an animal hide easier and, uh, and make a, a decent kill a lot quicker. Uh, of course, canoes are another thing. People finally start to venture out onto water for the first time. And pottery, like you see up here at the top right. Okay, People start to have a recognizable form of uh, advanced culture, right? something that they're able to be a little bit more inventive because they have a little bit more spare time. They're not spending all day hunting animals. Okay, um, So this becomes a little bit more of a uh, culturally specific phenomenon. So now let's discuss a little bit more of the specific societies that we see from this time period, specifically the ones that exist in Mesoamerica. Okay? And when we say Mesoamerica, meso just means middle. 
okay? Okay, when we're talking about Mesoamerica, uh, we're not necessarily talking about North or South America, but specifically the area of Central America, Mexico, okay? And the first group that we'll talk about here is one that your book actually does not cover, okay? And uh, I'm not sure why the author chose to skip over this group, but it's actually a very important group, and it's the Olmec, okay? Um, the Olmec civilization is estimated to have existed from around 12,000 or 1200 BCE up until around 400 BCE, okay? So this is still before uh, the beginning of the Common Era, okay? So still during the, uh, uh, the, the Copper Age, I guess you could say, leading into the Iron Age. Um, and it's a really important culture because it's kind of the precursor to all other pre-Columbian Central American cultures. Okay? It's the one that we start to see specific um, uh, religious traditions coming from, traditional um, uh, forms of architecture, of uh, societal striation, and so forth. There's a lot that goes into the Olmec that gets handed down into future cultures. That's my point. And you can see here, um, the, the Olmec zone of influence is kind of right at the little uh, curve here in the, um, in the peninsula that goes down into South America, okay? Uh, you have three specific areas down here, kind of this little purple area in the crook at the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, Tres Zapotes, San Lorenzo, and La Venta are the three major um, uh, centralized zones of Olmec culture here. And Olmec culture has a lot of different things that go into this. Okay, ceremonial centers is one specific part of Olmec culture that gets handed down to just about every other Central and South American culture during this time period. Okay, and ceremonial centers, when I say that, what I'm talking about is like a temple complex. Okay, it's usually a large um, uh, artificially carved area. Okay, sometimes it's uh, actually uh, has cobblestones or, or a paved road or something that goes into it, but it's almost like a like a town square type situation. Okay, or a plaza of some sort. Okay, eventually over time this becomes a little bit more refined with future cultures, but ceremonial center is typically where a central temple of some kind is located, and it becomes kind of the centerpiece of the entire um, surrounding village of some kind. Okay. Um, much in the way that uh, European cultures were using um, uh, temples and eventually churches as kind of the center of their towns, okay? Very similar concept. And the temples themselves are typically pyramids, okay? Um, the, uh, the image that you see in the background here is actually this a uh, large hill that's in the very center right next to the words temple pyramids is actually a man-made pyramid. Okay, this is an earthen pyramid. It's not made of stone, but it's made of dirt that's been piled up over time. Okay, um, and the uh, calendars, of course, is another thing that the Olmec uh, end up discovering. Okay, they realize that you can actually predict when uh, the summer solstice is going to happen, when the winter solstice is going to happen. Uh, they start to realize that um, uh, we can, you know, use numbers of certain kinds, right? Uh, I believe the Olmec or one of their, uh, it might even be the Maya, were the ones to discover the number zero, for example. And ball games are another thing. Um, if you ever watch, um, uh, there's a cartoon or two that exists out there, one called The Road to El Dorado. It's a little bit uh, you know, obviously it's a children's movie and so forth, but it's it deals with a, a ball game that's played with this group that I believe is supposed to be uh, like a Mayan or an Aztec civilization. And it's a, a ball game very similar to what you would see with soccer. Right? It's like a leather ball or a rubber ball in this case um, that would be kicked around. Uh, and the, uh, the ball games were actually um, a, a pretty dangerous sport, right? Because in this particular case, whoever... Uh, was the losing team was typically sacrificed to the gods, <laughs> okay? So you wanted to win. Um, and in some cases, if the crops are bad, whoever the winning team is, is sacrificed to the gods, right? It just depends on uh, the person in charge and what sacrifice is needed at the time, okay? So this is kind of a, a, a dicey situation to be in. And speaking of sacrifice, uh, ritual sacrifice is also originated uh, in the Americas with the Olmec, uh, from what we understand anyway. Um, and of course, various uh, cultures in, uh, in the future, the Mayans uh, and the Aztecs in particular, continue this tradition. Okay, and we'll see some examples of that here in a few minutes. 
the Great Pyramid at La Venta is what you see here in the background. Again, this is a man-made earthen pyramid, and you can kind of see there's a little bit of a raised uh, platform around it here that's kind of rectangular in shape. Um, this would have been uh, kind of this elevated little plateau where this would have been. It's estimated this took 800,000 days of labor to build. Okay, this is a long, long, arduous uh, task. Um, we know very little about Olmec culture uh, because they don't really leave behind any forms of writing or anything like that. Uh, from some of the hieroglyphs and some of the carvings that we do have, we estimate that they're probably authoritarian in, in form. In other words, they probably had a centralized um, king or somebody like that working uh, over everyone. Might have been a priest of some sort. Might have been a, a demigod type situation where an individual was believed to be divine. Um, and they used common labor of some kind, right? We don't think that this was slave-based, okay, because um, there's not really any evidence to support that, right? There's no real carvings, uh, base reliefs, or anything like that that suggests that. Um, the thing about this particular area, though, where, um, where the Olmec did exist, is it is low enough in... Um, uh, in, in latitude here, where it's actually closer to much of the rainforests that exist in South and Central America. So there was plenty of rainfall. I mean, even just in the picture in the background, you can see how green it is. Um, so there's no need for there to be any kind of uh, artificial irrigation. Okay, So you can estimate, too, that this uh, a lot of the, the cultures in the area probably would have worshipped a, a rain god, a sky god of some kind, uh, perhaps a jungle god of some sort. Uh, and some of the carvings and so forth that we have kind of give us a glimpse of what kind of animals and what kinds of deities they might have uh, revered. Okay? Um, it's, uh, there's a lot of uh, evidence here for uh, uh, obsidian and jade carvings like you see here. The one that's on the left is supposed to be a figure of a jaguar, I believe. Um, this is a, another base relief that you see over here. Uh, carved into some stone, it appears to be uh, some kind of a serpent or a serpent god coming out of the back of an individual. Um, and the Olmec civilization is inexplicably um, destroyed and or vanishes sometime around 400 BCE. Okay? And we don't really have uh, a general understanding of why. Um, they just appear to have uh, vanished, either from uh, perhaps a drought, perhaps from disease, from warfare, whatever the case may be. The Olmec basically vanish. Okay? Um, and the, the main uh, image that people have of Olmec culture, of course, is the giant Olmec heads that you see up here at the top right. Um, and I actually had the um, the privilege of seeing one of these face to face when it came to uh, the Kimball Art Museum in Fort Worth several years ago. Um, this is a massive uh, item, by the way. This is something that's roughly 10 or 12 feet tall, weighs several tons, um, and it's incredibly um, well carved. I mean, this is a, a photorealistic carving, especially up close. You can almost see the different pores in the skin of the face, okay? And there's multiples of these, okay? It's not just one of them. Um, so we, we have a face of what the Olmec actually looked like here. Now, the next one we can talk about here is the inheritors of the Olmec civilization and in a lot of ways. Okay? They existed at the same time in parallel form and eventually perhaps may have absorbed a few elements of Olmec culture, and that is the Maya. Okay? And the Maya are very, very familiar to a lot of people, okay? specifically the Mayan calendar, which you see up here at the top right, this large sun disk item. Um, of course, the Mayan calendar was the thing that came into uh, a lot of international attention with conspiracy theories about the world ending in the year 2012, okay, because that's when the Mayan calendar ran out. Okay? Um, so people had all these uh, crazy ideas, it was made into films and so forth about the end of the world and all this, but of course we're still here. Um, Mayan civilization is estimated to have existed between 3000 BC and 800 CE, okay? so a very long stretch of time, right? nearly 4000 years. Um, and their initial capital is at Teotihuacan. Okay, this is in the um, the Valley of Mexico, kind of the lower valley here, um, in the area that's pretty close to modern day Mexico City. Okay, a little bit further away from it, right? Um, further south you go here, uh, the more you get into Aztec territory, and we'll talk about them here in a little bit. Um, but Teotihuacan is established sometime in the fourth century BCE. Okay, right around the beginning of Mayan civilization. And by the time we get to the first um, 
you know, four or five centuries of the common era, the population that exists there is massive compared to any other culture anywhere in the world. Okay. Um, to give you an example, the, the population of the world at this time was only a few million people. Okay. And so for the population of Teotihuacan to be 200,000 is a large percentage of the entire world's population. Okay. And again, we don't have exact numbers. Okay. This is a, an estimate based on what we do have. Um, right. We don't know where every body of every human ever living exists, right, where it's buried and so forth. Um, but again, we have a general understanding here. Um, Temple of the Sun is the largest structure that exists in Mesoamerica. It's right around the area of where Teotihuacan used to exist. Okay? Um, and eventually over time uh, with climate change, and climate change is not necessarily a new thing, right? This is something that has existed and has affected humans over the centuries and over the millennia. Um, in the first um, few hundred years of the common era, and even a little bit before, Right, we still had enough global warming and enough climate change to where the Valley of Mexico began to dry up. Okay, initially it started out being uh, a little bit more forested, had a little bit more of a rainforest type situation, um, but eventually over time the climate began to warm up. Okay, and the um, the jungles began to dry out and drought began to ensue. And so the modern southwestern desert that we see in the United States going down into northern Mexico finally began to kind of come to the forefront a little bit. And so the, um, the Mayan civilization actually ended up moving across the peninsula down here, if you look on the map, uh, through the Olmec heartland and into the eastern portion, okay, a little bit closer to South America, right, where there's more abundant rainfall and so forth. Okay? So the city of Tikal is actually um, put together, you see between uh, the two points on the map here where it says Maya area on the eastern portion is Tikal. Okay. And Tikal had a population of roughly 40,000 people, from what we can guess, uh, between 600 and 800 CE. Okay, so this is around the time um, that the Viking invasions were finally starting to get underway in northern Europe, okay. just for comparison. Temple of the Giant Jaguar is another area that is very um, uh, famous around this area, okay, a little bit further to the east, right, a little bit closer to, um, to Colombia, modern-day Colombia and, uh, and Panama, that kind of region. And, of course, as you see in some of the images up here, um, we actually had uh, some paintings and some uh, illustrations that are done of human sacrifice, okay, and the Maya were one of the first to actually do this on a daily basis. Okay, uh, the, the image that you see here of the fellow having his heart torn out is actually um, something that was eventually done, again, on a daily basis to ensure that the sun would rise. Okay? Um, and the Maya did this, and eventually the Aztecs picked up on this as well. And, of course, one of the, <laughs> one of the practical questions of this is how do you find so many people who are um, going to be sacrificed? I mean, if you're doing this every single day, that's a lot of people to eat up in the course of a year. Okay. Um, essentially, what this would amount to is the people who were sacrificed were typically prisoners of war. Um, uh, perhaps uh, it usually was not a, a slave type situation, from what we understand, but um, you know, intertribal warfare and so forth. Uh, again, sometimes people would be captured simply to sacrifice them to the sun god. Okay. So you see here in the image, though, uh, what is probably a, a priest of some sort. Um, he's using some kind of a sacrificial blade or a knife, a spade of some kind, again, to carve out the fellow's heart, and then um, he would actually, his body would be tossed down the temple steps uh, to the bottom, okay? And then the heart itself would be laid on an altar somewhere on the summit of the temple. So pretty brutal, but this is kind of the, um, the initial image that we have of the Maya anyway. The next society we can discuss here are the Incas, okay? and the Incas are actually in complete isolation from the other cultures that we've discussed already because they're not in Central America, they're actually in South America. Okay? And the Incas, of course, if you look at the South American map here, are located all up and down the west coast of South America in the Andes Mountains. Okay? And as you can tell, the Incas actually uh, occupied a massive amount of territory uh, on the west coast of South America here. Uh, and over time, the, uh, the Incas appear to have gradually expanded from, um, 
from this particular area here around Machu Picchu, uh, which you see here in the background. Okay, Machu Picchu is located kind of in isolation up in the Andes Mountains. And eventually they end up flourishing out further, uh, going all the way uh, up here to the north, all the way down here to the south. Okay, so this is a really uh, massive expansion here. The Kingdom of Cusco, of course, is the one uh, that controls the entire span of Incan territory. And of course, if you're familiar with the, the Disney film Emperor's New Groove, okay, this is what we're talking about. This is the Incan culture. Um, Cusco is located, again, kind of right here in the central heartland of Incan territory. It was established sometime around 1197 uh, and uh, ends up expanding until about 1438. Okay, so this exists for quite a long time. Um, and, of course, the, the kingdom of Cusco is where you start to see the domestication of llamas and alpacas. Okay? This is where um, you have uh, a lot of the uh, kind of this Sherpa-like tradition of individuals who are kind of uh, have these trade caravans going through the mountains and so forth. The animals are a little bit more sure-footed. Uh, corn and maize are considered to be a sacred crop. Okay? Here you actually have a gold image of a llama. Right? Um, and, of course, the, the god that exists here, uh, this is one of the central sun gods. Uh, you see him in two different forms here, the, the statue and the, um, the carved image here. Um, and as you can see, he's holding in uh, one hand what appears to be a set of reeds, and I believe in the other hand, um, he's actually holding an ear of corn, is what it's supposed to be. Okay, so corn and maize are both considered to be kind of a sacred crop granted to the Incas by the sun god. Um, and the Incas uh, also have gotten into pottery and textiles, right? A lot of the, um, the descendants of the Incas actually are still engaged in the textile industry, right? These very colorful um, woolen uh, blankets and uh, shawls and so forth that you see, um, you know, the, the Sherpas in the region wearing and so forth. Uh, a lot of that was exported at the time and continues to be exported even today, okay? Uh, and, of course, pottery, a lot of the... Um, uh, really intricate forms of um, uh, even earthenware, right, stuff that was made into uh, even uh, funerary pots, right, where you would actually have an entire body buried in one of these uh, sometimes exists. And, of course, Machu Picchu that you see here in the background uh, was kind of the, uh, the centralized, um, perhaps, citadel. We don't really know. Uh, if this was actually considered a vacation spot for somebody, or if it was a centralized palace. I mean, it seems to, uh, it's well fortified, it's very uh, complex and so forth, so it appears to be some kind of a, a fortress or citadel or palace that might have existed. Um, the leaders of the Incas were considered to be divine. Okay, They were uh, you know, some kind of a, a demigod of some sort. And human and child sacrifice appear to have been another key feature of Incan culture, just like they were with the Maya and the Olmec. Um, specifically, we say child sacrifice here um, with a little bit of hesitation because it's kind of uh, difficult to tell in some cases. Okay? Um, one feature about uh, the Incas that exist from this time period, if I can pull up the picture here, um, is there is a, a particular element of uh, Incan mummies that exist uh, that are buried in very, very high altitudes uh, to where the bodies are perfectly preserved. Okay, and this particular one that you see here in the lower right, um, this is the body of a young girl who appears to be about the age of 14, um, who may have been buried sometime uh, around the year 14 or 1500. Okay, and uh, her body is preserved, I believe, um, perhaps at the Smithsonian. It's at one of the major museums in the United States now. And uh, she's kept uh, in a, a vacuum-sealed room under glass and so forth, but she's perfectly preserved. She looks like she's still asleep. Um, uh, all the hairs on her head are perfectly preserved. Her skin is still soft. Um, in fact, the, uh, the scientists who, who worked on her for the first time were so alarmed by how well-preserved she was, they believed that she was going to wake up at any moment. Okay? It's just that, um, that perfect. So... Um, so, again, whether this was a sacrifice or not, we don't know for sure. And we don't know if this young girl died from disease, uh, if she died from um, poisoning, what, whatever the case may be. We really don't know. Um, but going back to the, the culture itself, among the Inca, uh, the coca plant was believed to be sacred. Okay? The coca plant is what cocaine is made from. Okay, so um, quite often, you know, some kind of derivative of that would have been used uh, as some kind of a, um, a sacrament of some sort, kind of in the way that 
like a, a, a sacramental wine might be used or something like that at a church today. Um, you know, the religious leaders would, would ingest this somehow, perhaps have a vision from the gods and pass it on to the people. Okay. Um, eventually, the Incan Empire we know was wiped out by the Spanish in the year 1572. Okay, when the Spanish finally did arrive, um, they either uh, they began to suppress the Incas, uh, were looking for gold, were looking for slaves, and um, not only did they actively damage the culture, but they also brought disease with them. And most of the uh, the last remnants of the Incan civilization. Um, that weren't absorbed into um, Spanish culture and so forth ended up being wiped out by smallpox, dysentery, uh, typhoid, those types of things, because these um, the native tribes in the region had never encountered these diseases before and didn't have the antibodies to fight it off. Okay, so uh, it's it's like being targeted by any other major disease that you're not prepared for. Okay, so it's a very unfortunate situation, but the Incas are one of the only. Uh, Central American cultures that we do have a definitive date for in 1572. And the ones that are the most modern of the groups, and another one that we know uh, for sure of an end date, are the Mexica or the Aztecs. Okay? And uh, the term Mexica actually is, uh, of course, where we get the term Mexico from. Okay? The word Mexica is uh, the actual um, tribal name that the people gave themselves. Uh, the term Aztecs actually comes from uh, the term Azteca, which is um, a, a term that means people from Atzlan. Okay? And Atzlan is supposed to be um, a, a settlement in the, the northern part of Mexico where the Aztecs appear to have migrated from. Okay, so it's uh, the Mexica were what the Aztecs called themselves. The Aztecs were what the Europeans called the Mexica. Um, Tenochtitlan, of course, is the uh, the capital city on Lake Texcoco. This is in modern day Mexico City. Okay, and if you go to Mexico City today, you can actually find in certain quarters of the city um, some of the cornerstones of Tenochtitlan that actually still exist in the ground. Okay, there's a specific uh, part of the city where one of the major cornerstones of a building um, does exist still in the midst of the cobblestones. It's kind of a, a remarkable thing. Um, and of course, the, the Mexica, the Aztecs, are, are known for vast amounts of wealth. Okay? They are the ones that had stone temples, paved streets, uh, very complex marketplaces. They had uh, trade that existed from the Aztecs all the way through the Mayan civilization and well down into the Incan civilization. So you might get jade, obsidian, uh, cloth, and pottery all the way down from South America being brought into the Aztec realm. Okay? Um, and of course, the Mexica are extremely wealthy when it come to, comes to gold and precious metals, pearls from the Gulf, uh, silver from mines nearby, and uh, agriculture. I mean, they were masters of, um, of irrigation, as you see here in the background. Okay? This image of, um, of Tenochtitlan is kind of an artist's imagining of what the city might have looked like. Okay? It was a well-fortified city that existed on a lake with a land bridge, um, or with an artificial bridge going to the land. Okay. Um, similar to this, if you think about it in these terms, um, again, I'm using pop culture here, but the, the Hobbit film, if you ever see the image of um, Lake Town from that, okay, it's, it's a very similar thing, except uh, the Mexica actually had uh, a stone uh, base for, for their city. Okay. And so this seemed like a, a floating city, but it was really a city on pretty firm foundations with a firm land bridge going, so well fortified, if nothing else. And of course, they can harness the, the water from the lake into uh, irrigation and grow crops uh, almost from stone in, in the city itself. So uh, incredibly uh, well structured and well advanced. Okay. Um, and it's estimated that the, uh, the Mexica actually had uh, 371 city-states with 38 different provinces by the time 1519 comes around. Okay? So this is a massive area, okay? uh, bigger perhaps than the Mayans uh, and, the, uh, and the Olmec had. Um, and of course, the, the Aztecs and the Mexica themselves also had a very um, highly regulated form of religion, okay? similar to what the Maya had. Uh, again, you see a very similar image here of human sacrifice with a, a priest carving out the heart of an individual, tossing them down the steps. Um, the rulers were considered divine, very similar to what you see with the Incas. Um, and they had um, different um, social striations too. You had a ruler that was divine, nobles under him, 
priests, warrior heroes. Okay, so you had different um, uh, a class structure essentially that existed here. Okay, um, and of course you had um, specific gods like uh, Huitzilopochtli, which is what you see up here uh, on the right side. Okay, it was kind of the serpent god uh, that was uh, very heavily plumed, right? A lot of feathers and so forth. Um, and the image that you see here at the bottom right is uh, a knife that was perhaps one of the ceremonial knives that would have been used uh, by a priest to carve out someone's heart. Okay. Um, and of course, the Mexica and the Aztecs, we also know, were conquered by the Spanish um, once uh, Cortez arrives. Okay. And so we'll talk a little bit more about him in the second part of the first chapter here. Okay. But the Mexica, the Aztecs, uh, were extremely, extremely advanced and had, uh, again, vast amounts of wealth. And it's no surprise that when the Europeans arrived, they thought that they had found this fabled city of gold when they discovered the Aztecs. Okay, so now we can move into North America. Okay, now that we've talked a little bit about some of the Central American ones, now we can talk about the tribal native North Americans. Okay. Now, to get uh, across the border here into the United States, we start to see uh, the arrival of a lot of the southwestern tribes, okay? Um, around 500 CE, okay, this is, again, around the time that Christianity is finally brought to um, Western Europe, to the British Isles, and so forth, around the same time period, we have a group of people who migrate from northern Mexico into the southwestern portion of modern-day America that are known as the Hohokam. And the word hohokam means those who have vanished, okay? um, and they vanish specifically because of drought, okay? because of what we've already established as the reason why um, the Mayan civilization began to move further south towards South America is because we're encountering climate change. Okay? Um, and the next group, of course, that uh, are also very, very famous uh, are called the Anasazi. Okay? And the Anasazi are called the ancient ones. And, uh, how ancient, we don't really know. Okay? The Anasazi uh, have all kinds of myths and legends kind of surrounding them. Okay? If you believe the X-Files, <laughs> the Anasazi were actually aliens. Okay? But I, I'm not going to go down that path. I'm not going to pull at that thread. Um, we're talking about actual historical evidence here. We know that the Anasazi... Uh, were cliff-dwelling people, okay? And if you go to Mesa Verde in Colorado today, you can actually still see the cliff dwellings of the Anasazi, okay? Here in the background, um, these were extremely well-fortified and very um, sophisticated um, um, stone houses that were built directly into the cliffside, okay? Um, and there appears to be no rigid class structure among the Anasazi. They appear to uh, have been rather peaceful. They really only engaged in warfare when it comes to self-defense because all they really have to do here is pull up the ladders and no one can get in. Okay, so it's, uh, this is still before any kind of um, siege warfare of, of any kind tries to make its way to America of any sort. So um, the Anasazi are in a very uh, comfortable and safe environment here. Okay. They do manage to build irrigation canals for agriculture just to harness what rainfall they can. And of course, um, Anasazi and all other southwestern cultures are known for making uh, very uh, beautiful forms of pottery. Uh, the turquoise jewelry is also extremely famous. You, know, you can go to places like New Mexico and buy squash blossom necklaces and so forth. Um, and when it comes to their uh, religious structure, okay, they tend to be very animistic. Okay, they tend to worship, uh, you know, obviously a god of rainfall, perhaps a sky god, a sun god, a god of the land, um, and their their mount, their temples are made into mounds, kind of like what we saw with uh, the Olmec, right? Kind of this earthen pyramid type situation. Um, those who uh, do not live in cliff dwellings like the Anasazi, right? There's a lot of other southwestern tribes lived in these uh, adobe huts, like what you see here. Okay, and these kind of rounded huts made of sun-baked mud that turn hard and um, can be brittle, but if the if you pack it in tight enough, it becomes pretty um, pretty hard. And of course, because of how little rainfall there is, there's no real risk of this disintegrating over time. And of course, the Pueblos are the name given to uh, the cliffside adobe villages that do exist. Okay, so if you uh, if you hear about the Pueblo Indians, for example, um, this is what um, that's what's um, uh, given to them by the Spanish specifically. 
Now, when it comes to Northwestern tribes, okay, if we move up a little bit further, okay, um, Northwestern tribes tend to be uh, largely hunter-gatherers, okay, because this is still kind of up and down the Pacific Northwest region of the United States, okay. Uh, of course, because these, this is a coastal uh, civilization, they have access to, of course, the sea on uh, the western side. And if they go east, they have uh, extensive woodlands. Okay, You have all kinds of wild game that exists there. Um, and so most of their society, in terms of diet anyway, is uh, based in seafood, whaling in some cases. Right, They might be able to harvest uh, whale blubber, uh, might be able to harvest uh, ivory for carvings and so forth, seal skins for uh, waterproof boots and leggings and so forth. Uh, and the Northwestern tribes uh, tend to uh, have very long trade routes, okay? In some cases, um, uh, evidence for uh, Northwestern tribes have even been found all the way as far south uh, to the east as Mississippi, okay? So uh, long overland trade routes with other tribes that have different cultures. Uh, and the Northwestern tribes are known more for uh, for woodworking skills. Okay? This is where the totem poles are found, typically, right? A lot of uh, very intricate wood carvings with those, uh, with canoes especially as well, okay? A lot of imagery with eagles and so forth, uh, with the animals that live in the region. Uh, sometimes you'll find carvings of walrus uh, and so forth. And in some cases, this goes all the way up into southern Alaska, okay? And the Inuit that live up there uh, actually have uh, a, a culture in and of themselves, okay, based very largely in uh, in hunting seals, hunting whales, um, ice fishing, and so forth, um, carving, of course, in ivory more than anything else, uh, using furs from, uh, you know, large land-dwelling animals and so forth. So um, slightly different from what we see in the northwest portion of the United States, okay, this is still um, moving a little bit further into Canada more than anything else. Um, houses of Northwestern tribes were plank houses like this, okay, kind of these long houses built from the woodlands that exist around them. So again, wood carving is very, very important to the Northwestern tribes. Um, and the society itself is estimated to be divided into um, three different striations. You have chiefs who oversee the tribes. You have commoners, of course, that engage in one form of trade or another. You might have an artisan or a... Uh, a uh, hunter or a fisherman or something like that, and then you have slaves at the bottom, okay? Now, the Great Plains tribes are the ones that people are probably the most familiar with in terms of popular culture, what has been portrayed, and so forth, in some cases very unfairly. Um, but Great Plains tribes are kind of the, the archetypal image of the Native American, okay? Um, and Great Plains tribes, of course, are located all throughout the central portion of the United States. Okay, this is the, <clears throat> excuse me, the um, hunter-gatherer society that's primarily nomadic. Okay, and when I say nomadic, what I mean here is they didn't stay in one sp specific spot. Okay, they moved with the seasons, they moved with the migration patterns of animals, specifically the buffalo. Okay, um, but of course these are located all the way from central and south Texas, well up into Canada. Okay, so all throughout in the region where uh, where you know where where I'm sitting right now in North Texas, going all the way further north, and of course bison are the primary uh, protein that these tribes would have been uh, able to access. And at this point in time, bison existed in the millions in the United States. Okay, um, by the time we get into the 19th century, those numbers drop dramatically down well into uh, only a few hundred in some cases. Okay. But at this point in time, there they were so many of them, uh, th there was no, no uh, horizon for them. Okay. There was no uh, hint that they would ever go extinct. Um, of course, uh, in the gathering aspect, they would have to gather seeds, nuts, roots, and berries, just like their predecessors did in the archaic Indians. Um, and, of course, in the Great Plains, there's very cold winters, right, especially if you go up further north, uh, if you go from, uh, you know, Nebraska all the way up into Canada, right, it, you start to see more and more snowfall that actually happens. Uh, of course, in Central America down into South America, or Central United States down into Texas and so forth, of course, the summers are incredibly hot, just unbearable. Um, so, of course, migration happens with the seasons, right? They were able to watch the animals, kind of know when to pack up, um, and, uh, and so forth.
And of course, in order to do this, they have to live in these collapsible teepees that you see in the background, okay? Uh, and of course, the teepees are made of uh, long uh, poles, wooden poles made from uh, long trees and so forth, uh, covered in animal skins, okay? And animal skins were able to keep out the heat, uh, were able to keep out the weather conditions, um, and left a small smoke hole at the top for you, where you could build a fire inside and so forth. And of course, the Great Plains tribes are known for clothing made out of animal bones and leather. Okay, they, they didn't waste any part of the animal when it came to hunting buffalo and so forth. Um, so you see these really, really intricate items here. Okay, uh, Of course, the, the feathers of eagles and so forth are, are used for a lot of the headdresses. Um, of course, today, um, of course, if you try to harvest an eagle feather of any kind without permission from the government, or if you're not a member of one of these tribes, it comes with a pretty hefty fine, <laughs> okay? So, um, and of course, uh, elements of cultural appropriation and so forth have um, have frowned on anybody except the tribes themselves using these items today. So it's a, uh, it's a very rapidly changing culture, of course, in the 21st century that we see. Um, the introduction of horses to the Great Plains tribes actually doesn't come uh, until uh, the Comanche tribes uh, gain control of a lot of Spanish horses around 1706. Okay? So before then, uh, Great Plains tribes had to hunt on foot, okay? and hunting, uh, hunting wolves, hunting bison, and so forth was extremely difficult and dangerous, as you can imagine. Uh, a full-grown bison can mow down three or four people and trample them to death. Okay? So. Once we get a little bit further into the future here, once we start seeing um, native responses and interactions with, uh, with Europeans, we'll start to see exactly how this ends up integrating. And of course, the, the entire religious uh, structure of Great Plains tribes, and a lot of Native American tribes for that matter, tends to be animistic. Okay? And the word animism simply means that, uh, that there is a belief that there are spirits in all aspects of nature. Okay? Every animal, every rock, every tree, every stream, every lake. Um, this is a, a, very, um, a very old belief system and one that uh, existed even in, in Europe in some cases. Okay? There were sacred spirits or gods that existed in a, a, in a well, in a forest, in a stream, in a, a lake, and so forth. And so the Great Plains tribes were very eager to extend respect to an animal that they had killed. Um, there was usually a ceremony that went with it to show appreciation, perhaps to sacrifice part of the animal back to the gods, back to nature, and so forth. Uh, and of course, there's plenty of sacred rites that were practiced to ensure that a good hunt happened. Okay, if you uh, ever see any images uh, of the Native American tribes, usually um, the the skull cap of the buffalo with the horns were used as a way to kind of induce the spirit of the animal into the hunt to gain favor with the animals and with the gods themselves. Now, going down into the southeast portion of the United States, we can talk about the Mississippian tribes. Um, and the culture that exists as the, the largest central portion of the culture is called the Adena Hopewell culture. And this existed from around 800 BCE until around 400 CE. Um, and it's largely agricultural because this particular region, kind of in the central portion of the United States, modern United States that is, going down into the south, the, the soil is very, very rich. Okay? Um, so you would be able to grow corn, the, the beans, the squash, uh, sunflowers, uh, tobacco is actually something the native tribes um, discovered first and were able to grow. Uh, and of course, even today in, in the Carolinas, this is where the, the primary region of tobacco uh, is actually still done, even today, hundreds and um, even in some cases over a thousand years later. Um, but as you can see here, there are different little striations, different uh, groups of the Mississippian tribes that existed in certain areas. Uh, the Caddo Indians, for example, kind of in the, uh, the East Texas region, uh, going all the way down into South Appalachians, Middle Mississippians, and so forth, right? Different little structures, communities, all very similar in terms of what their tribes were able to do. But again, depending on the landscape, depending on the climate, um, their cultures varied in slight ways. Uh, they all were very similar in the fact that they do have uh, earth works, right? So what I mean by that is they were able to build up the dirt and create, in some cases, fortifications, right? They might have been able to build something similar to like a moat, 
type situation like you might see in uh, like a, a castle in Europe or something like that. Okay, um, And burial mounds are very common too. And this is another interesting idea um, that was also shared by Europeans around the same time. Okay, um, Burial mounds are where you build up basically uh, a large mound of earth and then you carve into it and create kind of a, a cave type situation, very similar to like a if you look at the adobe huts a few uh, slides before, very similar type of a situation, right? Kind of this dome structure, sometimes made of stone or something, almost like a little cave, okay? And you would place the body of the individual inside with trappings from their life to accompany them to the other world, okay? Um, and one of the most famous ones that exists in Adams County, Ohio, that you see in the background here is called the Great Serpent Mound, okay? And it's kind of hard to tell from the image. You may have to look it up later on Google or something, but um, if you look at it from the sky, it's in the shape of an undulating serpent, okay, kind of winding back and forth here. Um, and Mississippian tribes had their own specialized labor divisions, okay, kind of like what you see with the Northwestern tribes, but a little bit different in the fact that the, um, the different aspects, the different um, labor divisions were able to actually uh, have different levels of respect within their own culture. So you might have a fisherman, a farmer, a hunter, uh, cooks, artisans, mothers, right? They have their own little individual cultural spheres. And of course, all kinds of different artifacts have, uh, have lived on afterwards. So you see these different ceremonial pipes here that are in the shapes of different beings. Uh, one in the shape of an otter holding a fish, for example, right? Very photorealistic. One in the shape of a bear, another in the shape of a human head, okay? And of course you see uh, the antlered human mask, okay? This is uh, the, the image of an antlered human being as kind of a spirit of the forest or something, is something that also exists in pagan cultures in Europe during this time period, okay? So a um, lot of a um, lot of elements in these types of tribal communities that end up linking them together with other cultures all over the world, again, roughly at the same time. And Mississippian culture is expected to have existed sometime from around the year 800 all the way up until uh, the Spanish began to arrive in the Americas around 1500. Okay. So eventually they end up going into decline, not just because of European uh, you know, introduction or anything like that, although that is part of it but uh, also just due to, you know, various tribal movements, tribal warfare, drought, etc. And again, very similar type of um, cultural structure with a central plaza, like a, a ceremonial center, like what you see in Central America, uh, with a temple in the center part of the village. Okay? And it may be a wooden structure here, it may be an earthen structure, um, there's all kinds of different images that exist uh, from um, from sketchbooks that were done by Europeans from the time period that were able to capture some of this. Um, so it, it varies from one culture to the next though. So the last group that we'll talk about here today is the one that the, uh, the English in particular come into contact with and the ones that we have the most record of uh, in European journals and diaries and so forth from the time period and that's the Eastern Woodland Tribes. Okay? Um, and these are located primarily in the area that becomes New England over time, going down into the middle colonies. Um, and two different tribal groups emerge here. The ones primarily that the English come into contact with initially are called the Algonquin tribes. And these are located primarily up here in New England, uh, around the Great Lakes region, into the upper Midwest, and into Canada, uh, and um, into Maine and that sort of region. Okay. Um, Algonquin tribes were patriarchal, so they had a male leading the tribes. Uh, they traced uh, tribal lineages back through the men. And they were a mixture of hunter-gatherers and uh, agriculturalists. Okay, So you had individuals that were pretty omnivorous in this regard. Right, They might be ones who uh, hunted and fished, but they also tilled the soil and grew crops. Okay, um, Some of the crops that they grew were, uh, of course, like... Um, maize and corn and beans and squash and so forth, a lot like what we see everywhere else in the country at this point. Um, this image that you see at the bottom right here is actually a ceremonial rattle that's made from a turtle shell. And the houses that they lived in were primarily wigwams, right? These little small uh, one individual or one family hut, kind of around the size of a camping tent today. Okay? And in some cases, they might live in a, a much larger longhouse. If you're a, a wealthier family or something, or if you had a larger family, you would build one of these. 
Um, long houses, of course, are, as you can tell here, very, very large, okay, and we're typically two-story. Okay? If you look at a, a cutaway of this, there's typically a ladder going to a second level, and uh, a longhouse could possibly hold as many as a dozen people, okay, just given the size. And I include a little image here of a, a, a tribes person that was actually sketched by a European during this time period for, for size and, and so forth. And as you can tell, um, this, this tribes person is actually uh, taller than the doorways are to these places, and it's for a very good reason. Um, this was actually a way for um, the, the people living inside the hut to actually have some means of defense, okay? If you have invaders who are coming into a, a village somehow, and they're, you know, trying to get inside of a hut to attack people, to take people away, whatever the case may be, they would have to bend over and crawl on their hands and knees to get inside, okay? And all you have to do in order to defend yourself if you're inside this hut is to wait inside with an axe or something like that so that when they bend over, their head is the first thing to come through the doorway. All you have to do, chop it off, okay? So this was actually a form of defense that was used not only in the Americas, but also in some cases in Europe, okay? Um, and sometimes you would also have uh, different palisades that would be constructed around villages, okay? Uh, palisades are wooden fences made out of sharpened poles, okay? So very good way of deterring invaders. And the other group that actually exists a little bit further to the south in modern-day New York, Pennsylvania, the Carolinas, even down into Georgia, were groups called the Iroquoians. Okay? And the Iroquoians are very, very similar to the Algonquins in many ways, but one primary difference is that they were matriarchal. Okay? They had a woman leading the tribes, and the, uh, the women were the ones that would be uh, looked at in terms of um, lineage and patronage. In this case, matronage, okay? looking at the... Um, you know, going back in, in terms of the tribes people. Um, and for the Iroquois, war was integral to their society. It was uh, a matter of honor, right? You had to engage in warfare with your enemies at all times in order to prove that you were, um, you know, that you were a decent enough human being, right? You had to, to be able to prove to yourselves, to society, to the gods, whatever the case may be, that you were worthy of continuing on and were worthy of honor. Okay, so the Iroquoians and the Algonquins were constantly fighting with one another. And of course, as I said before, this is the group that ends up coming into contact with, uh, with most of the Europeans that finally do end up settling in this part of the country. Again, mainly the English and eventually the French over time. Okay? So we'll get into the next half of the chapter here and we'll talk more about the Europeans.